Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. On this show, we reviewed many a comic based on 80s cartoon staples. <laughs> comic staples? Uh, yeah, okay, never mind. Today, we begin looking at an early 2000s revival from Wildstorm, featuring some humanoid feline people and their battle for survival against an old enemy. No, ALF was not a weirder show than you remember. I'm taking issue with Thundercats. So let's crack open issue zero and see if this story makes us want to turn the page or turn our heads. The cover has a pretty exciting dynamic. The team all together with their arch nemesis up in the corner. And is it just me or is Mumra laughing at the same thing as Lion-O? Do you think that they spend a whole lot of their time watching funny internet videos of humans? Written by Ford Lytle Gilmore and J. Scott Campbell, and accompanied on art by Reese York and Studio XD, we begin with Wily Cat and Snarf watching Lino strike a pose. Standing still in the woods for hours on end is his best chance of landing a modeling contract on Third Earth. The young cat wants to join the others in battle using a real weapon like the Sword of Omens rather than the bag of tricks he and his sister usually utilize. Two strikes to Lino here, one for that really weird, goofy smile, and another for handing over his blade to the kid so he can swing it around. Yeah, that's not going to cause any problems. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Cat goes on to describe the other Thundercats' weapons and how essential they are to defeating Mumra and the mutants. Man, if they ever do a crossover with the X-Men, things are going to get real awkward real fast. He describes Panthro being ambushed by Monkeyan and Jackalman in the Forest of Silence. Hello, Forest, my old friend. I've come to prune your limbs again. Despite the two-on-one odds, he soundly defeated them with his battle sticks. Considering they're basically nunchucks, I wonder if, much like Michelangelo from the old Ninja Turtles cartoon, he had them replaced with cat-themed grapnel lines in the UK. Then there's the story which is apparently dramatic enough for the kid to add a... wherein Chitara and Tigra stole the Bracelet of Power from enemy territory. I think Chitara may be taking the whole a gift from me to me idea a little too seriously. Since only the spotted of the pair has any super speed, Slythe and Vulture Man aren't far behind, forcing a direct confrontation. Between invisibility and super speed, Slythe gets ensnared by V-Man's net, while Chitara trips the avian villain for Tigra to throw the lizard at him, warning them against stealing Thundarian relics ever again, and having a hearty laugh at their expense. And you know what? Points for the birdies floating around Vulture Man's head being tiny running Chitaras. What can I say? I appreciate the classics. Finally, Wily Cat recounts Lionel's anointment trials, which involved meeting Mumra in his pyramid, and doing the whole Thundercats battle cry. Thunder! 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 Thundercats! Ho! He proceeded to flip over the foe, stab him in the back upon landing, and snidely smiling while telling him to die. Then Lionel says none of those battles happened as they were just told to us. So that's why this is an issue zero, because apparently nothing's happened! He says that a warrior's heart, spirit, and teamwork matter more than the weapon they wield, when Wily Kit shows up, having been looking for the pair to take them back to base. Lion-O says that someday, when the twins are older, they may find themselves adopting new roles in battle, but for now they should maintain the status quo. As they leave to confer with Panthro, we go to the Onyx Pyramid, where Mumra has watched the Thundercats, and figures he may be able to exploit Wily Cat's impetuous desire to become a warrior. We end on a caption promising that the next issue will pick up with a cartoon left off. So make sure you binge watch the entire series within two weeks, folks! Work, school, family obligations, none of these should stand in your way for the full context of some background easter eggs that may or may not show up in subsequent issues. And even though this is a magical pool he's laughing at, he is technically watching cat videos. I do have to say, though, maybe a red text that fades against a black background in the dialogue bubble maybe not the best choice, as it makes the text kind of difficult to read. Maybe part of that is the scan, but I think that more helps my point than hurt it.
After the story, we get several pages of sketches, some remarks about the format of the story ahead, and additional artwork. Not all of it, but enough that you should get the gist. As for the issue itself, it works fairly well to introduce you to the team and plenty of action to show you some of what they can do, even though we find we were following an unreliable narrator. Which kind of makes sense, since that dramatic stabbing of Mumra seems like something a kid might come up with and think is cool, and actually seems kind of like a satire of the greer trends of the day, which kind of continue today, but moving on. I didn't really mind the art for the most part, but some of the facial expressions looked really weird, possibly because of all the lines drawn for some kind of detail or another, something Jim Lee does. Not to mention Chitara's feet. I just... I just don't know what's going on here. It doesn't look like a case of angles or perspectives. They just kind of look like deflated clown shoes. No disrespect to J. Scott Campbell, but are his feet drawn weird here because he studied under Rob Liefeld? On to issue number one, with our heroes again featured on the cover, but looking like they're heading into battle, and now with Linkso and Pumira along. Worth noting is, while Gilmore is still writing, Art has changed over to Ed McGuinness, Jason Martin, and Chris Walker. We begin with a flashback narrated by Lionel, which begins with ellipses as if it's continued from somewhere, but this is the first page, so kind of weird. Anyway, he's recounting his defeat of the villain Pyron just before taking down Mumra and reclaiming the Key of Thundara at exactly the 24th hour. In retrospect, it was a little overly dramatic to add a countdown just to find the key to the China cabinet. A giant Thundercat's emblem mounted on the wall came to life, which apparently preceded New Thundera being restored to its original grandeur. So with this summation and the narration that feels like it skipped a couple of details, I'm guessing this is a rundown of the series finale, which, while I did watch some of the show as a kid, I don't think I ever saw for whatever reason. And even though I joked about it before, I, myself, am kind of a completist, so probably would want to watch the whole series before jumping right into the last episode, just so I don't miss any story points or context. But that's not exactly a viable option for a number of reasons at the moment. In their base, the Lord of the Thundercats is declaring this a momentous day, and for all intents and purposes, this planet should drop the new from its name and just be called Thundera. We celebrate our victory over evil by confusing the postal system! He wants Panthro to get to work on a beacon, and Tigra, who's basically teleconferencing with Pumira from somewhere else, is tasked with designing a signal tower so they can call the rest of their race in from across the galaxy and bring them home to really begin rebuilding their kingdom. See if we can get Peter Cullen to record a planetary message. He's got an awesome voice and he's done it so many times in the Transformers movies, this should be a cakewalk. Ooh, we need a welcome cake for everyone. And you know, with the coloring on that screen, I thought maybe that was Bengali, not Tigra, and he'd mistakenly been put in two places at once. Inside the Onyx Pyramid, disembodied voices note the failure of Mumra and Pyron, and decide to summon a new warrior from the Kitty Pool of Doom, Shadow Master, who apparently already has a grudge against the Thundercats, so that's convenient. He's ready and eager to destroy them as commanded. To enhance his power, they'll plunge the planet into darkness by creating an eclipse on Thundera. If Shadow Master succeeds, he'll be freed from the Shadow Realm, though failure will result in him staying there permanently, so evil gives you a day pass to do their bidding. Good to know. Apparently unstoppable in the shadows, almost like he's a master of them or something, he vows to wipe the Thundercats off the face of their own planet, disappearing during his maniacal laughter. These mysterious voices might be evil and malicious, but they seem keenly aware and respectful of their enemies renaming the entire planet. Panthro detects the eclipse happening at the wrong time of the year too quickly to be natural, and also happening planet-wide. What is happening on Thundera? We can't see, wise one. You better be serious this time, because if this is another crack at the blind guy, I'm gonna thunder smack you upside your mane! The darkness is blotting out all our sensors! Is that true, or do you just not have anything for the seismic or sonic variety, dude? Anyway, he sends Chitara out to Sector 7 to investigate. Before long, she sees what looks like a mass of black water, still charging forward as the substance opens up a path leading directly to Shadow Master. 
Oh, it was you controlling the shadows. For a second, I thought I had a Moses thing going on here. He doesn't open with an attack, only wanting to relay a message that he's going to kill the Thundercats before he wills the shadows to close in on her. Figuring there must be more going on, she uses her staff to vault to a higher vantage point and says aloud that the enemy is creating an army of shadow creatures, even though all we the readers see is some spiky looking effects. Feels like they could have lost a little dialogue and just shown us the creatures, but whatever. She returns to base just as the eclipse completes and the creatures begin taking on more noticeable monstrous forms. So cue the iconic battle cry and the team charging into battle. Use your weapons to cut them in half. He's the scientist of the group, you know. However, the enemy forces reform just as quickly as they're harmed, being living shadows and all. Normal weapons don't do any real damage, says the guy that just told people to use their weapons against them. Once again, the smart one of the group, ladies and gentlemen. They realize the only way to stop the horde of shadows is with light, because no frickin' duh, and the Thunder Kittens are called in to throw some of their flash bombs and give some to the team. Wily Cat insists on using his, while his sister passes hers out, which is in keeping with his earlier desire to get more entrenched in battle. This, however, proves a less than smart move when one of the creatures pulls his hoverboard from beneath him, leaving him at their mercy. That is, until Bengali saves his hide, then reprimands him for not being a team player. It's up to us to decide if we sacrifice you to this ravenous army to save ourselves, is that understood? With their supply of bombs thinning out, the blind Linkso uses his enhanced senses to detect Shadow Master hiding within one of the creatures, and directs Lino where to strike. Whether or not the two-page spread was his idea is anyone's guess. After revealing the villain, he hits him with the Eye of Thundera, vanquishing him, ending the eclipse and the threat. Now let's get back to work on the signal beacon. We've got a planet to repopulate. Raising. Back in the pyramid, the voices, revealed to be the ancient spirits of evil, figure that with more Thundarians on the way, which will cause their power to diminish for some reason, and given that their new champion failed, it's best to revive their true champion, Mumra the Ever-Living. <laughs> and just look how happy he is. <laughs> because he only failed, like, a bunch more times. Apparently evil spirits count victories like golf scores. The fewer you have, the better you must be at it. And I guess issue zero takes place before the series finale, what with Mumra having been walking around there. As far as the art goes, I have a preference to McGinnis over Campbell here. Less detail with hard lines that arguably might not even be necessary, and an overall feel more akin to the cartoon that it's continuing from. Both artists happen to give Chitara a more hourglass figure, as opposed to the more athletic look of the animated series, though not quite as hourglass as the 2011 reboot did. It's not surprising since she was a very common cartoon crush for many growing up in that time, and what some deem attractive or sexy will change or exaggerate, and it especially happens by the artist, or even by convention of the medium. Oh, Bart, cartoons don't have to be 100% realistic. <laughs> Mind you, I'm not bad-mouthing or championing the decision, it's just an observation and an opinion I have as to why that is. Either way, I expect a sufficient amount of trolling comments about how terrible a fan I am. Or would, if anyone watched the show. As to the first full issue story, it's got a good premise, and it feels like something that would appear in the show it's emulating. But the sense of danger wasn't all that present. Instead of giving Chitaro the heads up, Shadowmaster should have tried to capture or kill her, only for the speedster to escape, see what he's planning, and warn the others just as the horde closes in. And apparently, it really would have helped if Panther actually listened to other people's suggestions and installed some motion-activated floodlights around the base, but no! Which actually brings me to my next point. Even ignoring how an obvious revelation of use light against shadows comes off as something none of them would have thought of before, it might have helped the tension if the team was shown being increasingly tired and overwhelmed, and Linkso shown struggling a bit more to locate Shadowmaster before Lionel basically shines a magic light on him to make him instantly disappear. But the writer pointed out in issue Zero's extras that each issue will have a self-contained adventure with an overarching story tying them together. Tune in next week to see how well that goes. 
I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues. Thank you.